M S W Media. Welcome to Teacher Quit Talk. I'm Miss Redacted. And I'm Mrs. Frazzled. Every week we explore the teacher exodus to find out what, if anything, could get these educators back in the classroom. We've all had our moments where we thought, what the hell am I doing here? From burnout to bureaucracy to soul-sucking stressors and creative dead ends. From recognizing when it was time to go to navigating feelings of guilt and regret afterwards, we're here to cut out the gaslighting and get real about what it means to leave teaching. We've got insights from former teachers from all over the country who have seen it all. So get ready to be disturbed. Join us on Teacher Quit talk to laugh through the pain of the U.S. education system. We'll see you there. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. And welcome back to Clean Up on Aisle 45. This is the podcast that's here to document the hard work of repairing the Department of Justice and all the stuff that got broken over the last four years. I'm Andrew Torres. Hi, Andrew. I'm AG. This is episode 15. And we have a fantastic interview later with Marcy Wheeler on the insurrection. That's coming up a little bit later in the show. Yeah, but but before then, we've got to thank our new patrons. So special thank you to Gary Van Domselar, to Great Dark Lord's Toilet Companion, <laughs> Gordito 1981, Data Diva, Torts Illustrated. That's it. That's a <laughs> that's an exceptional pun. I love uh, that one. How have we never thought of that? <laughs> Alan Kerr, Lore Phoenix, Dexter King Williams, Stephen Sutleaf, and UK MSW Open Arcs listener who is not a fabulous lesbian, but is fabulous. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and also thank you to Craig uh, Walner and Peter Graham, Tim Barkley, Roxanne Hurst, Sally Gilman, Susan Johnson, Carly. Arnie Fleischer, Don Underwood, Mackenzie Goodwin Tran, and Stacey Robinson. And if you'd like to hear your name read, get the ad free version of the show and the opportunity to join us on live Zoom hangouts, Q and A's, and bar trivia. Woohoo! <laughs> Head over to uh, patreon.com slash aisle 45 pod. That's A I S L E 4 5 P O D. And give us a little, as, a, as little as a buck an episode, yeah. a buck an episode. You can have it all. You can have it all. <laughs> all your wildest dreams will come true. That that is true. Uh, absolutely guaranteed by uh, by AG. So, um, AG, it's day 98 of the Biden presidency. So that means it's time to check in on promises made during the first hundred days, because, you know, we imbue numbers that end in zero with a special meaning. <laughs> yeah, except, you know, when we use the don't you know, I, I prefer if we use the metric system for everything. Yeah, well. Um but that also means it's the first 100 days of cleanup on aisle 45. Ooh. And I think there are a lot of things to check in yeah, on, yeah. right? Um, I, it, look, uh, we knew <laughs> President Biden was coming in uh, with a lot to clean up and a pretty ambitious agenda. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't want us to do anything as... Uh, you know, facile as assigned letter grades or whatever. But um, I, I, I think kind of as a top line, I it, it's it's been a pretty successful first hundred days. Um, I it Biden really laid out you know the areas where he wanted to focus. Right, uh, obviously the pandemic. <laughs> um, there's been a a a, a government wide. You know, we've talked about. Uh, the climate change initiatives. Um, we talked about changing the culture on immigration and changing the law with respect to immigration. That's That's been a mixed bag, and we'll talk about that. Um, and, uh, you know, restoring a sense of 
uh, decency and justice to the Department of Justice, which is kind of our uh, our our bailiwick. Um, I I would also add a category, and I, and look, I I think this could be used as an excuse, right? But 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 in the first hundred days, I think we should identify items that are stuck in the Senate, right? Um, you can look, right? It it would be cynically easy and you know if two years from now what we're saying is you know biden sent these 17 bills to the oh, okay but but in the first hundred days right it's, it's it's not his fault no and and i mean considering that we did pass the american rescue yep. plan which is a huge 1.9 trillion dollar bill with with tons of provisions and it's going to lift half if, if some of these things are made permanent which they want to do in the in the future infrastructure bills it's going to lift half of the kids in this country out of poverty i mean there's just i can't I, we don't have enough time for me to go through all the provisions of the american rescue plan but it's huge it's massive and of course we did the whole uh you know working across the aisle thing where every time he has a big plan he says 2 trillion dollars and then he invites some republicans over for dinner and they say 600 billion and he goes thanks for playing and then he goes budget reconciliation and we get it passed but to have this kind of massive measure passed in the first 100 days in office is incredible i, I mean the aca took 10 months yep. and they used budget reconciliation because they were, they spent so much time listening to what republicans wanted to put in the bill hoping they would get their votes and never getting them, even though those amendments were made, uh, learned a lesson. And I think it really paid off. And so I think as we start to see the benefits of the American Rescue Plan trickle down into the economy and, and start having everything work, we're going to start seeing his uh, approval rating go up even more. And and uh, But just that, that I, I think people underestimate that massive piece of legislation in the first hundred days is huge. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right, and 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 you're 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 correct to to put it in that kind of historical context. Um, something that I think also gets overlooked because it's now normal and part of the landscape. Um, Biden's promise in December was to roll out a hundred million doses of the COVID nineteen vaccine. But by, by the way, that was before finding out that the reserves that were left mm. were, you know, an empty closet. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've hit double that, over two hundred million doses. Um, pretty much anybody who wants one can can get it, um, and uh, and 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 that really is. Uh, that's a major accomplishment. And I would and I would include with that um, changing the culture from the top down. Right. Uh, from having, a, a, you know, Dr. Fauci say, well, you know, it's kind of nice to have folks around who listen to science. Um, I, it, it it promoting a responsible you know, culture of mask wearing. I mean, you know, look, maybe it's because I live in a blue state. Uh, but, uh, you know, I I see among my Republican friends and colleagues, right, a, a, a sort of normalization of like, uh, OK, like, you know, I guess if you've gone down the QAnon rabbit hole and you think masks are part of a government plot, to, you know, whatever. I, but 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 by and large. Right. We can take that for granted because um we we have a grown up at the helm. Yeah, it's terrifying to think where we would be. Yeah. Had we not won this election. And then we've got other things going on, too, uh, as far as paradigm shifts and, and sea changes and what other sort of buzzwords you want to use for the opposite of the bullshit that was happening for the <laughs> previous four years. Uh, we've got now, I mean, there is a commission underway studying domestic violent extremism. Yep. Uh, we've got the Department of Homeland Security now looking at uh, white supremacy in its ranks, not looking at white supremacists in the country, looking at who works for the Department of Homeland Security that is a white supremacist and uh, or part of one of these uh, militia groups. So I think and, then, you know, we you and you and I covered the EPA going through all this shit that was written that isn't scientific yep. and was pro business uh and weeding that out and i mean just all of all of the agencies simultaneously tasked with this sort of let's go back to science 
Um, I know that you you brought up something uh, in our notes today about uh, Lloyd Austin uh, mm-hmm. addressing climate change uh, within the Department of Defense, which which what we were doing under the Obama administration, the Department of Defense has been concerned with climate change for decades now. Uh, it, it's just been sort of kept on the down low by Republican administrations. <laughs> But all of this stuff and, and, you know, our friend Josh Geltzer, who we've had on the beans, is is one of the people heading up this domestic violent extremism commission to look into it as a threat here uh, in the United States. And, I, you know, I keep I keep ta- I keep up with them and he's like, I can't tell you anything yet. I can't tell you anything yet. But they are <laughs> they're working on it. And it's it's just an incredible shift from what we've been dealing with in the last four years. Uh, and and including you know you and I are going to talk about uh, this a uh, little bit with Marcy Wheeler, the Department of Justice, right? With their new investigations, bringing back investigations for the Civil Rights Division into policing, right? Yep. It's so important. Yep, I I I, I couldn't agree more uh, with all of that. And that you know you sort of skipped over some of the 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 top line you know attention grabbers, right? Rejoining the Paris Climate Accords, blocking the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, uh, the executive order ceasing drilling in the Alaska National Wildlife Reserve. Um, it, it it really is uh, a, a a focus, right? The the Biden nominees, you know, to an individual have said uh, that this is something that there's a top down directive to make this a priority across the entire executive branch. And and we're going to see that in the comings and goings. I mean, you see it in the hirings. Uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit more in the D block. So um, those are all real positives that the, the superlatives are deserved. Um, I, I, I want to mention one thing where I, I'm, I'm not I'm not giving up on this one. Um, we can talk about the real changes made uh, at, at, with respect to immigration and and they are real. And I suspect you're going to talk about some of them. Um, There is this administration has continued the shameful abuse of 42 U.S. Section 265. Uh, That's the so-called Title 42 deportations. Um, That's not what they are. That is restricting, essentially sending back asylum seekers uh, at the border. And 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 remember that. When you seek asylum, that's different than ordinary immigration, right? Those are folks who are suffering persecution in their home countries. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and and this administration is using the pandemic and using the emergency authorization that is designed. We, we talked about this on the show, but I, I'm not going to let it go. Uh, designed to give uh, executive agencies the authority to set up quarantines, uh, and they've used that to to send home asylum seekers, um, and that you got to do better. That you have to change. It's mm-hmm. just wrong. Yeah, and he was also going to keep the limit on how many refugees could be allowed into this country. Uh, there was a huge outcry about about that. And so now they're revisiting that. Uh, so at least they're revisiting it. But yeah, that abuse of, of the quarantine rule is needs to end uh, and it needs to end immediately. And, and, you know, and the only positive thing I will say is right. We, 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 we now have a voice and we have an administration that is surrounded by decision makers and influencers and voices that listen to people like you. So, you know, make your voice heard on that. Um, we're, we, you know, we're not we're not mindlessly shilling for Biden. It's it's way better than the last guy. Uh, but where there are things that still need to be done, um, you know, we're going to we're going to call that out. Yeah, we have a far more malleable administration as far as interacting with what the public wants. Exactly. Uh, and I know Jen Psaki has brought this up multiple times in multiple news conferences when asked, oh, you know, Biden hasn't met with McCarthy. Uh, how are you calling that unity? And she just keeps saying over and over again, look, he's talking about unity when he ran on unity. He's talking about uniting the voters, the American citizenry, <laughs> the people of this country, not, you know, fucking Kevin McCarthy. Uh, you know, 
<laughs> or Ron Johnson, who still yeah. <laughs> has to return some Russian donations. We're not, we aren't trying to please those outli like Josh Hawley, the the single sole senator who voted against the COVID nineteen anti hate act, right for uh, Asian American Pacific Islander yep. hate, uh, was you know with regards to COVID nineteen single holdout the one senator 94 to 1 who who voted against it and, and yeah i'm not going uni- to i'm not going to unify with that guy yep sorry it's just not going to happen but the way that you know with the approval numbers and how 69% of the people approve of his handling of, of the pandemic 62% of the economy uh, i mean it's 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 seemingly obvious to me that this country as far as the citizens go is far more united in this first 100 days of the biden presidency than we had seen in the previous 4 years i i i think that's right and i think i i'm i'm curious your take on this right um president biden announced a an ambitious two point three trillion dollar infrastructure bill. Woohoo! Yeah, and and you know it caused some of the like truly dumb arguments of like, well, you know, this good thing is not technically infrastructure, so I'm not sure it belongs in the bill. I I, I don't I have no idea. You know, uh, I, I don't think lexical arguments are particularly persuasive. Um, but but here's what that what that did. Um, it prompted. A Republican counteroffer, and again, far less, but a, but about a six hundred billion dollar Republican counteroffer, right? Yeah, just like the American Rescue Plan, right? But but were you like me? Were you actually? I mean, everyone was like, "Oh, Peshaw with your six hundred billion." But have you ever seen Republicans offer to spend that much money on anything besides tax cuts for the rich? I am so glad that that is exactly my take. Right? And half of that, right? Uh, over two hundred billion dollars is for rebuilding roads and bridges, right? Something that uh, it, I have been waiting, right, for people who are elected officials who have to service their constituents to say, um, "Yeah, the the bridge is about to collapse in my, uh, you know, and kill many of registered voters." Um, and 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 that didn't happen. At all. And it didn't, it, you know, it didn't happen under the other guy, not because Democrats weren't willing to spend money on infrastructure. Right. I mean, that was it was a promise. It was a thing that was made. I, I had the exact same take as you did. And, and and some of that is that, like, you know, I'm thinking about it from a lawyer perspective. Right. If I say uh, if I file a lawsuit against you, A.G., and I say you owe me one hundred thousand dollars and your lawyer calls me up and says, uh, uh, we're going to offer twenty five. I. I that signals to me that your lawyer wants to talk. Yeah. You know, uh-huh. if your lawyer calls me up and offers $50, okay, that says I got to take you, you know, we're going to be litigating this until something changes. But I, to me, I, I thought that was real progress in a way that, that we hadn't seen since, you know, Mitch McConnell started Mitch McConnelling things. Yeah. And I, I don't think that I mean, I still think that we're going to end up with most of what Biden wants in this bill. And we're going to do it without Republican support, uh, just like we did with the American Rescue Plan. We we got from the parliamentarian, I think, two more instances of budget reconciliation we could use this fiscal year. And and so I, I that's how I'm assuming it'll go. But the outreach was made. An offer was made. I was just shocked just to, again to see Republicans want to spend money on anything yeah. at at the at the six hundred billion dollar level uh, that, again, wasn't a tax cut for the rich. I was like, well, hello there, yep. uh, re- Republicans who and, you know, I, I haven't heard as loudly as I thought I would be hearing. The argument, the, the the deficit hawks, the budget hawks, <laughs> the national debt hawks, right? Because they know they aren't going to be able to get away with that argument because of this the $1.9 trillion tax plan that, by the way, never trickled down. I know we're all shocked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> discredited economic theory is discredited. That's not, you know, news <laughs> at 11. But uh, yeah, no, it, it, it y- you... I don't know that that it's a Biden accomplishment. I think it's a it's a you and I and, you know, the 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 job that liberal commentators have done over the past decade in really saying, look, anybody who gets up and sheds Paul Ryan crocodile tears about the, you know, national debt clock is lying to you. Yeah. Something. Wait, what was it? Something D.O.O. Economics. Voodoo economics. <laughs> it essentially says that at this point, um, anyone see what anyone see this before? Anyone see this? Anyone know what this is? This is the laugher curve. Are you are you drawing it on a napkin? 
<laughs> I am. I'm just uh, how many times I've watched Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I can't tell you. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> oh, what a classic. Yeah. Uh, so a, a couple more little bits um, stuck in the Senate. Uh, and, you know, and, and to me, this is really the test. We don't have another, I don't, maybe we'll check in in another hundred days or what have you, but, but, um, but, but to me, the test over the summer is what progress in addition to the infrastructure bill, what progress can the Biden administration make on three areas, right? The for the people act and the John Lewis voting rights act, right? So that's HR one, uh, and the John Lewis amendments, um, for, needed voting reform um for hr5 the equality act right um and uh for the the george floyd justice and policing act um those all three have passed the house uh and all three are stuck in senate limbo and um and that's to me that's sort of the next test of leadership is what can you do right because those are not under current rules available to use budget reconciliation processes to pass. So you would need 10 Republicans or to get rid of the filibuster, which we also know. Uh, and you and I have talked about this. Is it going to be, well, we can't get these bills passed. And then Manchin and Cinema said, fine, we'll nuke the filibuster on certain things or voting rights or something. Uh, but who knows how it's going to turn out. But that you're right. That is the true test of, of leadership because he can unify the country. But without 10 Republican votes, you're not going to pass any of those things. And without without 51 votes to kill the filibuster, you're not going to do that either. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. Well, I think it's been a great first hundred days. Um So much has gotten done. There's there's stu- there's a million things we're leaving out. Uh, I know. Uh, because it's just been such the hit the ground running it, it, and without a cabinet too. I mean, yeah. the amount of obstruction and burrowing and uh, we didn't get uh, Merrick Garland until 10 March and we still don't have U.S. attorneys. I mean, considering all of how difficult the former administration made it for this administration to be successful, I think it's doing a phenomenal job. I'm I'm with you. All right. Cool. Well, I'm glad I voted for him. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Anyway, uh, everybody, we're going to take a quick break right here, but we'll be right back. We've got more stuff coming up. And later in the show, we're going to talk to Marcy Wheeler about the insurrection. And boy, she's got such incredible information. I, she is the good universe version of, you know, the the photos and thread in the tin shack. Um, she just knows all the connections without uh, having gone insane. So I envy her on that. Yeah, so if you want to hit pause on this, go read emptywheel.net and then uh, come back. You'll 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 have I think a good primer. Uh but it's an incredible blog. I I suggest everybody read it and and we'll be back with more news and her interview in a little bit. So just stick stick around. We'll be right back. Hey everybody, it's AG and today's episode of Clean Up on All 45 is brought to you by the best cereal ever. It's called Magic Spoon. Incredibly delicious, but also super healthy. And it brings joy to your mornings or afternoons or evenings or my midnight snack time. My favorite food growing up was always cereal, but I had to give it up as an adult because of all the sugar and carbs and chemicals and junk. Uh, But then I tried Magic Spoon. It tastes exactly like cereal from your childhood, but it is super nutritious and good for you. Magic Spoon magically has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, four net grams of carbs, and only 140 calories per serving. It is deep breath, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. And exciting news, Magic Spoon is releasing two amazing new flavors for a limited time only, cookies and cream and maple waffle. And if that isn't the most comforting, indulgent combination, I do not know what is. This is the ultimate treat-yourself combo, so make sure you get some while you can because they're only good for a limited time. Or you can build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, and cinnamon. I love the great new flavors, and combining them is amazing too, cocoa and peanut butter together are delicious so go to magicspoon.com slash cleanup cleanup is all one word to grab a new limited edition cookies and cream or maple waffle or custom bundle and try it today be sure you use our promo code cleanup at checkout to save five dollars off your order cleanup is one word this offer is now good anywhere in the u.s or canada yay canada but only when you use the code at checkout and magic spoon is so confident in their product it's backed with a 100 percent happiness guarantee so if you don't like it for any reason they will give you a full refund no questions asked but you will love it get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash cleanup and use code cleanup to save $5 off. 
All right, everybody, welcome back to Clean Up on Aisle 45. Uh, I would now, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about, first of all, the Department of Justice announcing now a second investigation into patterns and practices for policing, this time in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, And it was just, I think, a little over a week ago, Merrick Garland announced an investigation into Minneapolis Police Department patterns and practices. Uh, This is a a thing that Obama did like 15 times um, and then crickets throughout the (laughs) throughout the, the former guy's administration. Um, and you know, and interestingly, when Merrick Garland made this announcement, standing right next to him, Vanita Gupta, um, first woman of color, number three at the Justice Department, former Obama Civil Rights Division attorney, who's very familiar with these patterns and practice investigations. Can you talk a little bit about what these investigations sort of entail and why the Department of Justice has jurisdiction here? Yeah, um, those are fantastic questions. Um, so here's the federal government's interest, right? Um, you can bring pursuant to a federal statute, um, 42 USC section 1983, a civil claim against a state official for violating your constitutional rights. Um, How close was it to be, to being 1984 instead of 1983? I mean, we were, we were that close. Well, and 83 and 85 are the two biggest sections in civil rights. It's It's almost like a deliberate, you know. Finger in the eye of uh, like how of Orwell ho- supporters. <laughs> how hotels don't have a 13th floor. Right. We're like, let's, let's leave 1984 out of the code, the U.S. code. Let's do that. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So the, the DOJ has uh, a, a vested interest in um, gathering information and promoting best practices um, so as to minimize violations of civil rights by uh, by state officials um and uh it, you know if it is you you gave the introduction right um these don't always turn into policy recommendations they don't always get followed um but um you know we're at a we're at a pretty special time in history um and you know and again as we talked about in the a segment right like there appears to be real momentum for things that are very, very basic. This is going to tie into um, uh, specific in the next story. Um, There is overwhelming support for requiring police to wear body cameras that they can't turn off at all times during their interactions with, uh, you know, suspected criminals at stops. Um, yeah, and I think one one of the things I'm most worried about is that Republicans are not at all getting behind ending qualified immunity. And if we did a George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and we had to get 10 Republicans on board and the filibuster's still in place and it's uh, we don't have we haven't picked up more seats in the Senate or made D.C. a state and, uh, you know, we, we we can't use the budget reconciliation process and the rules don't change. All those things, I assume, are what's going to happen. Then then we end up perhaps with a, a, a justice and policing bill that's very watered down and doesn't really get at the it's not going to be enough, I think, to satisfy people. Yeah. Um, so so we covered on opening arguments the recent reforms that were passed in Maryland um, that were vetoed by Maryland's Republican governor, uh, you know, with a centrist reputation, Larry Hogan. Now, you know, and somebody who, by the way, is um, a very plausible Republican candidate in 2024. He's going to represent the Mitt Romney lane, right? Um, Right now, that looks like a losing lane. Um, But, uh, but, you know, like, Owning a lane is a, a, a tremendously good thing to have in a primary. Um, you know, it's sort of the 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 equivalent of you know where Joe Biden was uh, in in uh, in in the twenty twenty primaries, right? Um, he owned the conservative Democrat lane. Um, you wouldn't think that would be a big lane, and it turned out to be a path to the nomination. So I, I'm not saying Larry Hogan will be the Republican presidential nominee in 2024. I am saying he has a non-zero chance. And so looking at what he does politically, I think, tells us a lot about where a smart, savvy politician thinks his non-crazy bases. And 
that was vetoing really pretty modest police reforms. Um, the police reforms in Maryland phased in body cameras over the next two years. Um, you know, so, I mean, not even a, you got to do it tomorrow. I mean, it was a pretty long lead period, um, not hyper aggressive, uh, uh, required as um, part of the standard of uh, determining what excessive force is. Um, and, and and this, I think, is, is really, really smart. I hope this becomes a model uh, across the country. Um, the Supreme Court focuses on when force is justified, right? Um, but there is no corresponding obligation as to when that justification goes away, ah, right? Mm. And that's what we, yeah, I mean, that's what we really saw with Derek Chauvin and George Floyd, that like, look, look um, we could have a debate using the underlying standard, right? The Graham versus Connor standard that you heard both lawyers, you know, on both sides mentioned throughout the uh, the Chauvin trial. You could have a debate over initiating the the kneel position on George Floyd. You can't have a debate nine nine minutes in, right? right. You cannot have a debate, uh, uh, you know, thirty seconds in once he's subdued, um, right? Because yeah, you could argue, you know, hey, we had to pull him out of the car, get him in the prone position, and and okay. But yeah, to to stay there with the knee on the neck and the weight on there for long enough and four minutes after he stopped responding and then not uh, administering eight. Right. So, yeah, not just when is excessive force or use of force justified, but when is it not right? We have, when does it have to end? And, and, and that's kind of in the in the Minnesota um, police policy guidelines as, yep. as they brought out. They trotted out in court saying you have to reevaluate your use of force at every second. It's it's a. It's a moving target. It's not something that you decide and then you use that force through the entire rest of the altercation or the or the event. So, yeah, that's that's really interesting. And he, he vetoed that whole thing, huh? Yeah. And the third component um, is uh, part of changing the culture in police departments. Right. Um, and we saw this again. Again and again, you know, when the charges were brought against Derek Chauvin and, you know, the skepticism among our listenership that deserve it, skepticism of, you know, well, cops are never going to testify against cops and that sort of thing. Um, in, in Maryland, I, I didn't know this, right? Our police disciplinary board, uh, until this latest change, uh, was comprised of three police officers from the same department as the person who gets charged, at least one of whom must be of the same rank as the person charged. So wrap your head around what that means for a minute. That means if you charged a, you know, a, a, a precinct captain, you could technically have the board be two of his subordinates and then one of his buddies. Okay. So, so for, you know, for the rape prevention in the military, basically what they're saying is, uh, if I want to bring a, a, a rape case uh, that uh, three of my rapists uh, cohorts can be on two sub sub subordinates, including two subordinates, can be on that panel deciding whether or not to bring charges. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and so the third bill and this was called. Right. So that was euphemistically called the police officer's bill of rights. Um, and it had some other, you know, provisions in it. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you have the right you to see my face right now. Yeah. I can. What? I wish our listeners could. Um, the police officer's bill of rights. Yeah. yeah, you have you have the right to a uh, jury of your peers in the best possible sense of the word. So they changed that process and they made it so that now that the three judges on that panel are one representative of the police department at the same rank or higher than the person being charged, one active or retired judge, and one member of the community. Nice. That's better. Yeah. Right. It's better. It's not. That's the that's the key thing about all of that that I learned in looking at all these Maryland regulations is it. This is not, you know, crazy, you know, left wing abolish the police. And I'm not saying abolish. You know, I, I, I'm not saying de defund the police is crazy. I'm saying I'm, I'm talking about from the other side. Right. Like this was not a. A, a, a hugely left wing bill. This was a moderate to me consensus building set of modest reforms. And 
a moderate Republican governor with ambitions towards the White House vetoed it. So that tells you we got a lot of work to do. Yeah, it definitely does. And um, speaking of excessive force, Whew. did you watch the uh, the press conference after uh, Andrew Brown Jr., uh, who was uh, shot in his driveway by police officers? Um, they had uh, told the family they could see the body cam video, and they brought the family in today to watch the video. And there was uh, it, it didn't go smoothly um, <laughs> from from <laughs> from what we learned from that press conference because out comes uh, Crump and Bakari Sellers was there as an attorney representing the Brown family, and apparently the county attorney. And let me see if I can. If I have this right, the the Pascatank County attorney, uh, just attorney, is named Michael Cox. And apparently when Bakari Sellers and these other lawyers uh, who are not part of members of the bar of North Carolina wanted to uh, see the tape, the video with the family, uh, this particular county attorney said, no, you can't. And they said, yes, we can. We're the attorney. And then they pulled out the statute that shows that they can represent this person without being a member of the bar in North Carolina. The 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 county attorney, Michael Cox, actually said, don't you you, you can't fucking bully me. He said that you can't fucking bully me. And Bakari Sellers came out and said that to the cameras in the press conference. And he said, I'm hot. And as we say down in South Carolina, bless you. Bless your heart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I my uh my assistant is from Georgia and when she says bless your heart, you know you're in trouble. Uh yeah, but Bakari Sellers also added uh quote, I've never been talked to like I was talked to in there. Um yeah, let's let's kind of parse that out a little bit. Um n- number one, uh it is if not common, uh not uncommon. Uh, to assemble a criminal defense team that may include lawyers who are from out of state. Uh, they then you you must have to, to make an appearance in court. You must have local counsel um, who is willing to vouch for you and then move for your entry pro hoc vice. We've talked about that, like, you know, and and you saw how seriously, quote unquote, that gets taken, you know, with Rudy Giuliani uh, being, you know, having uh, being admitted in D.C. but expired, uh, failing to disclose that, and Pennsylvania being like, hey, come on. Well, Attorney Chantel Cherry Lassiter, who is a member of the bar in North Carolina in good standing, was there, and they brought up the Pro Hoc Vice argument, and he still said, you know, no. Yeah. And so she was the only one that was allowed to go in and watch the video. And, and uh, you know, I should get this little bit of the headline out. They showed him 20 seconds of one body camera video when there were eight cops there. I don't know how many cruisers, but at least one with dash cams. And there was, uh, according to uh, Chantel Cherry Lassiter, there was a whole bunch of a long series of events that happened before the 20 second video clip and after the 20 second video clip that they were not allowed to see and they weren't shown. And and just it seems like the, the now the county sheriff was very apologetic. Bakari Sellers said that they were very kind to him. Uh, but if this this county attorney uh isn't acting like he doesn't have anything to hide. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 putting it mildly. Um, yeah, and 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 again, just to be clear, right? The 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 pro hoc vice, the argument that you're not admitted pro hoc vice is nonsense, right? That is the technical requirement before you appear in court. They're not appearing in court, right? They are talking to the sheriff's office at at a preliminary stage. No, but they even had that. They even yeah. had somebody to sponsor them, even though yeah. they aren't appearing in court. So it's double dumbass on yeah. them. <laughs> I, I could have put that better myself. Um, and and uh, and yeah, apparently uh, they were shown twenty seconds of video uh, that they watched for two hours. They watched, you know, over and over and over again to try and. Uh, glean what they could um there's there there's there's more video than that so tons <laughs> and and so now they're calling for transparency and rightfully so and yep. the city de- declared a state of emergency before the family viewed this videotape that was oh okay all right uh and so they're they're doing that they're setting all that up um the the the, the city has uh placed seven uh, deputies on administrative leave. 
um, and three have resigned. Yeah. So I'm sure the video is totally fine, though, and everyone's completely <laughs> did what they were supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, I got to tell you, this was just from a PR standpoint, not not just ignore that it's completely wrong and inhumane and ridiculous, but just even from a PR standpoint, you have to think to yourself, why would you do this? These videos are going to come out. They're going to be demanded uh, that they would be seen. It's going to go to court. Uh, there will be subpoenas for them. At the very least, they will get the videotapes and the public will see them. Uh, why would you, if especially if these videotapes or the body cam footage is exculpatory for the police officers, <laughs> why would you cover it up at any it, juncture in the investigation? It, 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 makes, it makes no sense uh, other than, you know, old habits die hard. Right. And that if 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 you don't realize that we're in an age where, you know, that, that there's there's no suppressing the tape, um, you know, then uh, you're you're about to learn a, pa a painful lesson. Yeah. And I think that's sort of the difference that we had uh, in the, uh, you know, the Derek Chauvin trial, the murder there. We had um, Darnell Frazier's video uh, and. And we don't have that in this particular case. Uh, but now that, I mean, she, she's going to go down in the history books for what she for what she did. Um, yep. And in a very, very good way. And now it's going to be demanded that we that we see these tapes. Because before, right, like you say, old habits die hard. They're like, well, no citizens got it on video. So we'll just show them what we want to show them and redact the rest. And. Voila, the blue wall of silence. That blue wall of silence, when it came down in the Derek Chauvin case, it came down, I think, around the country. I I I share I share your optimism on that. I mean, you know, look, we, we, we will have to see. There is tremendous work to be done. Uh, but it does feel that way. It does it does feel like there is kind of a, a national consensus on um that that this is uh, uh, this is an easy policy to implement, uh, that it is in place, right? That is, you know, the, the mandatory body cameras and, um, and that there is, there is no downside, uh, to, um, you know, making sure that we have an objective record, uh, of what happened. And, um, yeah. And it's, it's, I think it's important to note that, uh, you know, when, when everyone had said, including us that, you know, Yes, the Chauvin verdict is is great. OK, accountability, but it's not justice. And I think the behavior today of the let me see if I can get it right again. The Pascatank County attorney is is illustrative of that, that, that we aren't done. There's still so much work to do and and we have to keep pushing um, now. Interestingly enough, the 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 attorney who did get to see the 20 second video, like you said, watch it for hours, Chantel Ch uh, Cherry Lassiter, um, she said um, she called it an execution. The cops approached his car in the driveway of his home. He had his hands on the steering wheel and they were approached him shooting him. Uh, and then at some point he backs out, goes around the officers to avoid interaction with them. So according to her, what she saw, not in a threatening, you know, I'm going to run you down, mow you down manner, but in a, I got to get the fuck out of here manner. Uh, you know, but the Supreme Court has decided you aren't allowed to shoot somebody fleeing as long as you're not, you know, a threat while you're fleeing. Uh, but uh, she said there were numerous assault rifles on the scene. There were already casings on the ground when the video started, which is what, you know, led to the conclusion that there's a lot more in the precluding moments of this video than they're letting them see. Uh, eight officers on the scene. Um and the, they had one of them had a Bushmaster AR-223. There were a couple of those and some Glock 17s. So you've got uh, AR, uh, you know, <laughs> semi-automatic long rifles uh, in this situation. And, and she said it was an execution. She said it was an execution. We have not seen the video. Right. No, no, nobody has. Correct. I have not seen the video. Only right. the family and her, this lawyer that I'm I'm quoting have seen the video. I've seen 20 seconds of it. So w with that bracketed, it is very difficult for me. I mean, the salient fact is that Anthony Brown was 
uh, supposedly shot in the back of the head. Um, it is really difficult for me to come up with a scenario in which you get shot in the back of the head uh, and you have presented an objectively reasonable danger to a police officer. Um, not saying it's impossible. I'm saying real hard to imagine that so and the other uh thing that uh, this particular lawyer brought up and again i'm just telling you what she said she saw was that as the car was driving away uh after having backed out in a non-threatening manner endangering other officers the car was driving away they were continuing to shoot at the car as it was driving away and then it drove into a tree uh so that is uh, her description of of what was in this video and uh, now the now the city's on lockdown and protests are, are going to start happening. And this was just botched by this by this county, by the county attorney from the beginning. And then to and then to say and then to just speak to Bakari sellers that way. Um, bad, bad, bad scene. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, uh, for the for the first time in a long time, there are reasons to feel optimistic that that justice will be done in North Carolina. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping for it. And uh in every instance and in instances going back and I hope to see what the DOJ uncovers uh in the Brianna Taylor uh case, or I should, should say for the Louisville Police Department and the Minneapolis Police Department. Those those investigations take years, so but we'll get uh, probably in you know intermittent updates on how they're going and what they're finding, uh but we'll be following all of it. Yep. And um God, just I mean, my my thoughts and my heart is is with the family of of Brown and and all these families and everyone impacted by this because it's it's a it's a plague. And and the 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 positive, the optimism you hear on the show is it, finally there appears to be recognition in society writ large that that this can't stand that 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 something has to change because uh, two years ago the this particular county uh attorney michael cox would have gotten away with what he did today and with yep. the, that would be the end of it it's yep. not going to happen this time so yep exactly keep pushing right. forward everybody stick around we're going to be right back with marcy wheeler we're going to talk about the insurrection what's going on in that investigation they have over 400 charged people now and they're looking at another hundred at least and then we've got 40 or so proud boys and oath keepers with conspiracy charges it's just a humongous the uh what they're calling the biggest criminal investigation in the history of the department of justice so we're going to talk about that with marcy wheeler right after this break stick around Hey everybody, this portion of cleanup is brought to you by the most useful app on my phone. It's my new favorite life hack. It's called Blinkist. Sometimes finding time to read is very difficult. I'm super busy. We're all very busy, but Blinkist is designed to solve this problem. It is a unique app that works on your phone, tablet, or web browser, and it takes the best key takeaways, need-to-know information from thousands of nonfiction books, condenses it down to just 15 minutes that you can read or listen to. Most successful people are voracious readers, and Blinkist makes it great for busy people who want to get the main points of a book quickly so they can start using the information right away. And with the audio feature, you can take it on the go. Listen to it on your walk. And 12 million people are using Blinkist right now. It has a massive growing library of self-help, business, health, history books, nonfiction. Blinkist has the latest titles from bestsellers, uh, as well as the classic nonfiction books you never got to read. But now, you know, you always wanted to, but didn't have time. I like Blinkist because here's how I use it. I get the 15 minutes. I get it all in my brain. And I use that information to decide which books I'm going to read in full later. Uh, I want to read Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. Uh, and it was, you know, fascinating. I heard the 15 minutes. I'm like, I'm getting into it. And with Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books, all the books you want to read for all one at a low price. And right now for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for you. Go to Blinkist.com slash cleanup and try it free for seven days. And you'll then you'll save 25% on your new subscription. It's amazing. Blinkist is B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash cleanup. Cleanup is all one word. To start your free seven-day trial and then save 25% off when you sign up. And that's only when you sign up at Blinkist.com slash cleanup. So check it out today. And joining us for the interview is a journalist extraordinaire, friend of all previous shows, making her first time appearance on Clean Up on Aisle 45, uh, host over at uh, a, a literally must read blog reading every day, the Empty Wheel blog, uh, Marcy Wheeler. Welcome to Clean Up on Aisle 45. Thanks for having me on. 
All right. Well, I we both wanted you on because um, you've you've really been uh, laser like focused on uh, on the January sixth insurrection, on kind of drawing together uh, the the dots, um, and and the work you're doing is just is just really fantastic. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you today. I remember the old days of our. Uh, massive murder <laughs> boards with pictures of yarn and threads and things going on in the Mueller investigation, and and your blog was uh, an indispensable source of information. And and some something that I've been thinking of these past uh, few weeks uh, is the John Schaefer cooperation agreement because. Uh, I think that the only, you know, and and they keep saying he's the first to cooperate, but I, I'm always quick to say he's the first that we know of publicly that's cooperating. But you called this, didn't you? You called that cooperation. Tell us a little bit about that. And do you think it's possible based on other information charges, filings, there are other things filed under seal. And we know that the prosecutors meant to file this one under seal, but they accidentally filed it to the public. That's why I think we know about it. What are your thoughts about that? And tell us how you pegged John Schaefer of Iced Earth. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so this is a dude who's um, got ties to Oath Keepers. And he was originally arrested. I mean, one of the things after reading 400 of these arrest affidavits is you begin to understand what they're doing in the arrest affidavits. And he was arrested for the trespassing charges that everyone is charged with. And, and that happens a lot. Like DOJ will arrest somebody and they'll say, it's just trespassing. And you look at it, like I read one today. I'm like, if this guy doesn't get three assault charges, you know, I, I, I quit. Right. (laughs) Um, But because they, they're not charging everything on the front round. And what they're doing is, because they were so taken by surprise by the attack, what they're doing is they're arresting, I mean, um, Chris Ray said this, they're arresting first investigating later. So they're arresting people, getting their phone and saying, oh, here you are premeditating all the things you did on January 6th. Therefore, we're going to charge you with obstruction. And, and so that happens over and over. In Schaefer's case, a couple of things happened. One, he's one of these defendants that got stranded. And that's not indicative of anything, but there's so many of them that a number of defendants have gotten stranded. They've just been left somewhere like um, Robert Giswine, who's another really key initial conspirator, got stuck in Colorado for a couple months, right? Um, I don't think anybody was going to let him out of jail anyway because he was both violent, tied to the militias, and one of the key people kicking off the entire insurrection. But they just you know, never made it here until D.C. until just now. Same was true for Schaefer. He was literally sitting in a local Indiana jail for months. And I I contacted his lawyer and I said, what happened to your client? Where is he? Bring him to DC. And he's like, can't talk. You know, and it's like, I mean, you know, defense attorneys don't talk anyway, but this was like a can't talk, can't talk. Schaefer charged with trespassing, but that's it. But they say he went in with bear spray. And they made a lot about the fact that he went in with bear spray. And Schaefer, as you mentioned, is a musician. And I think that one of the things DOJ did was pressure him with a charge of assault tied to the bear spray. There's a video of him somewhere spraying that against cops. And there was some back and forth. And his attorney at one point said, well, you know, I don't think you've got proof that that you sprayed the cops. And in that same filing you mentioned, it's, it's clear that they were going to, that's, that's one of the leverage points that they were using. And in Schaefer's case, I assume that that would make it a ton harder to travel to Europe, which is where his fan base is. And therefore, it would mean not just for the foreseeable future, but in the future down the road, he wasn't going to be able to, you know, do, to, to tour. So that's one of the things that went on. And, and, um, and then there are... I don't know, maybe 20 defendants who have never been formally charged, either indictment or information. And some of those, like another one where it's clear they're trying to get her to cooperate is Riley June Williams, the woman who stole the laptop. Um, And you can see why you'd want her to cooperate because she's just a bit player who got sucked into America first. Um, But if she can work your way up that string of people, then great. I'm, and, and also, she's not the one who uh, allegedly tried to make the deal for the laptop to Russia. 
So in her case as well, she's never been formally charged, even though the crimes are obvious, like, you know, stealing, stealing a Pelosi's laptop is a big one. Um, the other person this is true of, or there's a, there's a bunch of people this is true of, but another person this is true of is um, Baked Alaska. Again, a ties to America first. Um, and so, and in his case, uh, they also, I mean, he was only ever charged with trespassing and that's, I think what they were only ever gonna charge him with. But what's interesting is he's implicated in a case in Brooklyn right now and um, was described as co-conspirator in that case. Um, this is one where back in 2016, again, these Trump right-wingers were tricking African-American voters to vote by text and effectively stealing their vote. And so he was implicated in that. And there's, I, I wrote a post recently and I suggest there's something going on there. I don't guarantee that he's already flipped, but I, you know, they're, they're going after him. Another uh, couple that they're going after is this guy, Ryan Samsel, who is the first, he's, he literally kicked off the, even before Dominic Pizzola did. Um, and, you know, they're, they're really leveraging people, unsurprisingly, who have criminal experience, criminal, criminal past that'll, that'll really stack up the exposure. And in, in Samsel's case, he does have a background. He does have criminal past. He's the guy who kicked off the insurrection. He gave a cop a concussion by knocking her over. So he's looking, I mean, he could be looking at life, right? It, because all of those things, and if they ever go after seditious conspiracy, um, he also has not been formally charged. Now, and, and there, you know, there, there was this moment in his docket where he changed lawyers and then unchanged lawyers. And that's the kind of thing that you see when people are about to cooperate. But the other thing is they charged his girlfriend. Um, and so they charged his girlfriend with trespassing, um, same prosecutor, haven't charged, haven't formally charged her via information yet. And so something's going on there. But again, if somebody went to Ryan Samsel and said, okay, go start. And there's reason to think that, that Evan Nordine did, Ethan Nordeen did because they spoke right before that happened. Then it's a way for him to like implicate all these other people in his crimes and, so there's a, there's a bunch of incidences like that, that, um, that, you know, and, and I, you know, I think that they were probably pretty happy to have John Schaefer go first because, you know, people are not going to retaliate against him secretly. He's a public figure, but also, um, you know, it, it, I think it becomes easier for defense attorneys to say, look, you know, this dude would have been charged with assault when instead he's going to go home sooner than any of the other Oath Keepers. And um, so I, yeah, I mean, I expect to see, and, and the thing, the one other thing that I, that leads me to suspect this list of people that I have are, are cooperating is um, the government is trying to stall with everybody. With most people, they're saying, they're, they're submitting um, unopposed motions to continue, right? So they say, they write this nine page filing saying, biggest investigation ever, 900, blah, 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 500 ultimate targets, complexity, complexity, complexity. And then at the very end, there's one small paragraph that says, we ask the defense attorney unopposed or agree or what have you. But there's another kind of motion to continue, a consent motion to continue. And those cases, with the exception of one defense attorney who seems to be doing it that way, most of those cases look like ones that are ripe for, for cooperation deals. And so that's where I got my list. I, I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see whether I'm right about the other ones. <laughs> well, and, and, and I would, I would contrast what you've said with um, your, your post from, from last week, right. Talking about the case of Patrick Montgomery. And I, I guess the, the thread that I, inferred across those two is that the DOJ is being very, very careful with the plea deals that they're handing out. In other words, they are looking for folks who have information on the organization, funding, structure, how this was put into place. And if you don't have that kind of information that they're not interested in talking to you, you're right going to wait. You're yeah. Gonna wait. yeah, and that's that's kind of my question, too, is is I was wondering, Marcy, if you thought that that they were trying to roll these Oath Keepers and Proud Boys, et cetera, on each other, or if they were trying to learn more about the organization, or if they're actually trying to go uh, uh, up the ladder to figures like Roger Stone, Rudy Giuliani, 
uh, et cetera, or or maybe all three. I was just I was kind of wondering what your feelings were on that and what sort of information you've seen that would give any indication about who they're rolling on. Well, so after Schaefer flipped, all of the Oath Keepers, the 12 people in that one conspiracy charge, all got a filing that uh, included we've told you whether or not uh, we know of communications between your client and John Schaefer. So right now, and, and as far as I've seen, no other defendants have gotten that. So right now it looks like Schaefer's cooperation is all focused on those other Oath Keepers. Um, I think that they're, like Ryan Samsel, we don't know what his affiliations are, but I think that there are people who have ties to both organizations, um, like R- Roberto Minuta, right? There's this tie in Florida uh, between the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. And that's sort of where you see a lot of the planning that took place. Well, who else is in Florida? The guy they're all supposedly protecting, right? (laughs) And there's this there's this um, moment where if you look at the timeline from the Oath Keepers, there's this guy, person 10, he hasn't been rolled out yet. Maybe he's flipping on everyone, but he um, he's sort of the pivot point between everyone. So he'll get a call and then he'll call Stuart Rhodes and then he'll call Minuta and then he'll call Rhodes and then he'll call Kelly Meggs. And so he's calling everybody and, and you can tell that he's coordinating between people who are in different places in different times. And when he calls Roberto Minuta or Joshua James, who at the time were both still at what's the name of the hotel? The, um, begins with a W. Oh, the one where Roger was staying. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I forget. they were I forget still the at that hotel and he would call one or the other of the two people who were still at that hotel, hang up. And then 30 seconds later, there'd be a call back. So there was obviously some consultation. Now, maybe it was just between Minuta and James. Maybe it was consultation with somebody who was at the hotel. Um, but Stone was still at the hotel. Remember Stone said, oh, I never even left my hotel. Well, you know what? If you're sitting there with two Oath Keepers and they're coordinating everything from from there. The other thing is we know that um, the Proud Boys had people remotely that were coordinating. And so it would make it fairly easy for, um, you know, that's not Stone's forte, but maybe it's there. I mean, there are certainly people in Trump's immediate orbit who are, uh, good at this stuff and who, you know, would be interested in being involved. One of the other people, by the way, who um, is going to get a cooperation deal is a guy named Cash Kelly. And he's interesting because um, he was awaiting sentencing for dr- gang related drug crimes in Chicago and left and went to the insurrection. Um, but he had cooperated against his gang in Chicago. And so then his, you know, there, there are these cases where people were on probation and the guy's probation officer is probably like, oh, I just got you this deal. And you were, you know, like, and now you're, now you just stepped in it again. <laughs> well, you know, his, his, um, his uh, consent continuation motions talk openly about let's resolve this, you know, before indictment, blah, blah, blah. And he is tied to this guy, um, There are two Sullivan brothers, John, who was arrested, and James, who was not. They're both adopted African-Americans who grew up in Utah with this crazy-ass colonel or something, some military guy. Um, And John had had been identified in left-wing groups as a provocateur from a long time ago. His his Jaden X, his his video is, is Jaden X. James wrote Rudy Giuliani after the insurrection and bragged about getting some of his people released (laughs) and mentioned cash Kelly as the fixer or no, no, no. Uh, that cash was already arrested. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. But so we know that this, that cash Kelly is only two degrees of separation from Rudy Giuliani because Rudy Giuliani posted that to Twitter. (laughs) Um, and so cash Kelly is somebody, I love Rudy. (laughs) Yeah. Cash Kelly is somebody that they seem to be talking to about. I mean, and that, you know, there's another, there's another proud boy who also on probation and also they're trying to resolve it before indictment. Um, 
So, the, you know, the, the kinds of people that they're doing that with are, are quite interesting. And, and my guess is, yeah, there, there will come a time. And I actually sort of suspect that they waited until Lisa Monica was finally confirmed so that she could have her hand in the pot as well. But um, my guess is that there's, I mean, you mentioned that post I did the other day, right? So this is a guy who was arrested very early and just charged with, um, with trespassing. Yeah. I believe he was on the misdemeanor docket, right? Yeah. yeah. And then they came back and charged him um, and indicted him with, um, I think they added not just the obstruction charge, but also an assault charge. And, and everything like I, I'm buried. I'm, I'm going to down, I'm down a rabbit hole on what's going on in the Senate, because the thing about the people who were in the Senate, right. And he's one of them. Originally he was charged with, uh, with just the, tr the trespassing. He's got two more crimes. He's got a buddy who stuck with him as well. There's people in videos, two other people that are identified that something's going on with them. The people who, um, made it to the Senate, A, by and large, came in one of two doors. One door is the Northwest door where that's the one where people claimed that there, that the cops just let them in. Mm. Was that on the, was that in the gallery or was that on the floor, the well? Um, no, no, no. This is getting into the Capitol itself. Oh, so there's okay. The first okay, door, okay. which is the West door, then the Northwest door and the east door are are busted open at roughly the same time and the the east door is where all the oath keepers came in and um and that one was open from inside and there's a bunch of like who opened it from inside is an interesting thing um there's a bunch of people who are going to be charged with conspiracy for having been involved in that but like like that people went and we know some Proud Boys did this and they tried to get the North door open as well. The Proud Boys were about basically opening as many fronts into the Capitol as possible. And so, for example, Joe Biggs goes in with Dominic Pizzola, stays in minutes, walks all the way around the Capitol and then busts in the east side with this new mob of people and goes immediately to the Senate floor. And so and a couple of the Oath Keepers went immediately to the Senate floor um, Leo Bazell, Leo Bazell went immediately to the Senate floor. Um, and you, so he's this, you know, he's this, the son of generations of right-wing activists. Right. And he was actually charged and this hasn't gotten enough attention. He was actually charged with abetting and, or, uh, damaging the building himself. So he was charged with the same charge that DOJ is using to get to detention claims and importantly to get to terrorism claims mm. and they're mostly using this 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 structure with the oath keepers um and the proud boys it's like it's easy to blame the proud boys for dominic pizzola breaking that window right but doj has with some success done it with the oath keepers to say well you know they abetted the destruction of that second door and therefore that puts them on the hook for a crime of violence, puts them on a hook for a detention hearing and puts them on the hook for terrorism. Um, and Leo Bazell is one other person that's true. Now they never ever tried to detain him, but boy, you know, he's got ties and he very, again, I don't know which door he went in, but went immediately to the Senate. And the first thing he does in the Senate is he goes up to the cameras on the second floor and deactivates them yeah. so that you can't see what they had planned in the Senate. Um, so yeah, they're, they're like, I think, um, you know, the, the militia conspiracies have gotten a lot of focus, right. And rightly so because the proud boys at least clearly had a plan. They executed the plan brilliantly. They knew how to mobilize the stupid people who came in with no ties to the proud boys to get them violent. You know, they obviously Enrique Tarillo had some ties to, you know, like he was planning. All these people in Florida were planning. So, yeah, it's right that the Proud Boys should get the focus. But meanwhile, DOJ in recent weeks has been saying, let's flush out the story, both by arresting people with video, arresting co-conspirators um, and 
and doing deeper, the kind of investigation that maybe shows up in detention memos, right? Um, and they're fleshing out these stories. They're how the East door got opened, Pelosi's two offices, a couple other places. And, and those stories, I think, are going to get rather more interesting. Yeah. Tell, tell me what you mean by, by more interesting. I mean, I, I hear it in what you've just recounted to me, you know, approaching it as a lawyer, it, it, this is very, very good circumstantial evidence of planning and and coordination in advance, right? The, the three minute tour of all of the entrances, uh, you know, the, the coordinated opening, uh, the sort of targeting, um, you know, the turning off the cameras, all of those uh, suggest agreement in advance, which is how you go about proving that element on a conspiracy charge. Um, but, uh, but, but, but what else are you thinking in terms of uh, what's coming next? Well, look, I mean, DOJ has a long history of failed seditious conspiracy. <laughs> right? um, and, 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 and it's really, it's really overwhelming. I mean, I covered w- the most recent one was called the Hatari group in Michigan. I lived in Michigan at the time. And, you know, they, it was, I forget how many, nine people practicing and wanting to start a war by killing some cops and blah, blah, blah. And um, there, they hadn't established a conspiracy between the multiple partisans before they added the sedition. And then the sedition was sort of really tangential. I mean, it was like, we're going to go after the cops. We're not going to go after the Senate. And I think one of the reasons why they are focusing on the Senate and Pelosi is uh, because because it's clear that people in those buildings would have killed Pelosi and Pence yeah. and McConnell, frankly, if they got their hands on them. And if you can establish that, that raises the stakes of it significantly. But I also think, I mean, I, I think that um, you know the the right wing has a history of of. Uh, escaping conspiracy cases generally, right? Because they know how to work the press. They know how to, um, you know, they've got a very um, favorable Supreme Court at this point. Um, But I think that the charge DOJ is currently using to get people to a felony count, which is the obstruction charge. And they're arguing, you know, you're obstructing an official an official proceeding, you're, you're obstructing the actual vote count. And that all makes sense. And I think that that's legit, but I, that is going to, by the time we're done, that is going to be so pounded back and forth through the, through the appeals courts. And I'm not sure how robust it will be and how broadly they're going to, going to be able to apply that. And so I think that, um, I think that DOJ would like to get to establishing conspiracies between all of these little nodes of people. And then from there, argue two kinds of conspiracy, maybe, you know? So like, I, I actually think the case that the Oath Keepers committed seditious conspiracy is better than that they conspired to stop the vote count. Um, but the case that they were engaged in seditious conspiracy, I think is quite robust in a way that all those other failed uh, right-wing militia seditious conspiracy cases maybe were not. Um, you know, they finally attacked the, the the seat of government. Yeah, I I agree. I agree with you that the linchpin in prior seditious conspiracy cases has been it's a it's a I don't want to say convoluted. That's the wrong adjective. But it was a longer chain of inferences to overthrowing the government or interfering with an ongoing government function. Uh, and it's a real short chain in this case. Yeah, so. this one's a little more direct. Yeah, although eventually you're going to have to deal with Trump. Yeah. I mean, you're going to mm-hmm. have to deal with that. Yeah. Like I, I, every other defendant has said, well, Trump told me to yeah. do it. And particularly with the members of the military, current or former members of the military, they're like, you know, command order. Um, and I think that there are ways around this. I mean, even during impeachment, I was like, Pence has basically said Trump gave Pence an illegal order. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and it's clearly illegal. And so I think there are ways to get there. I just don't know. Um, you know, th- 
look, I mean, Mueller, there was abundant evidence that Trump had conspired with Russia. He just didn't get the witnesses to flip. He didn't get Stone to flip. He didn't get Manafort to flip. And, and without that, you're never going to be able to get to Trump. In this case, there's no one to offer pardons. <laughs> and these people hate each other. I mean, like, <laughs> half the Oath Keepers just loathe Stuart Rhodes. And that's a, that is a combination... You know, and then, as I said, you've got the people who have criminal records and the people who don't. Um, you've got, you, you know, like Ethan Nordeen and and Charles Donahoe. They're like, oh, we didn't even do anything. It was just those people off the street who were committing all the violence. Mm. And that's actually true. I mean, a, a remarkable few number of Proud Boys actually were the ones beating the shit out of the cops. Um, but they planned it that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And... Yeah, and once you're able to prove that, then um, you know every guy who beat up a cop is going to say Ethan Nordine told me to do it, and then eventually Ethan Nordine is going to say, "Well, Donald Trump told me to do it." You know? Roger Stone told me to do it. Giuliani <laughs> told me to do it. Donald Trump told me yeah. to do it. Yeah, shit rolls uphill. Uh, but we will definitely be watching this. Everyone needs to check out your blog. It's EmptyWheel.net. Do I have that right? Yep. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. It, it, amazing information that you put out there. So everyone check that out. And uh, just before I let you go, do you have any guesses, speculation as to who Person 10 mm -hmm. is? Oh, I um, I don't know the, those guys' identities well enough. To, I mean, it's it's somebody in the Oath Keepers. It's just somebody who, yeah, I don't. I just wait until they show up in a court filing and then I get to, <laughs> I get to meet them and, and learn all about them. Yeah, I imagine we'll find out, and I'm I'm sure as soon as you know, we'll be able to see it on EmptyWheel.net. So thank you so much for joining us today. Marcy Wheeler, incredible work. Thanks so much, you guys. Hey, everybody, it's AG for Cleaned Up on Aisle 45. If you're like most people, you almost never go to the doctor. Maybe when you're sick or hurt, but that's it. Um, especially during the pandemic, we've been trying to stay home. But finally, there's a practical and affordable way that you can take control of your health long term and get personalized care from the comfort of your own home. Study MD is your personal doctor online. It's telehealth done right. You start by taking a quiz to get matched with licensed primary care physicians who understand your lifestyle and your health needs. Next, you have a one hour appointment with your doctor to start a real relationship. After that, your doctor's available for you anytime by text, phone, or video chat. Unlike other services, this isn't a random doctor on call. Each SteadyMD doctor has a limited number of patients on their panel, so they have time to listen and give personal attention, the kind that you deserve. I actually found the quiz to be fun, super informative, and I love my match, catered just to me. I felt immediately comfortable and confident in my primary care provider. SteadyMD can help you get and stay healthy, manage chronic conditions and concerns, reduce stress, lose weight, sleep better, feel better, boost your immunity, so much more. Uh, all from the comfort of your home, in your jammies if you want. Skip the waiting room, skip the germs. Prescriptions are sent directly to your home or local pharmacy. All your medical records are in one place. And best of all, you get unlimited access to your doctor for only $99 a month. No additional visits or fees or co-pays. SteadyMD will help you understand and get the most out of your health insurance. But insurance is not required either. SteadyMD is now accepting members of all ages in all 50 states. So go to SteadyMD.com slash cleanup to take the free quiz and see which doctor is a perfect fit for you. Steady, S-T-E-A-D-Y, steadymd.com slash cleanup. There's no risk, no long-term commitment to get started. That's steady, S-T-E-A-D-Y, md.com slash cleanup. And we thank them for sponsoring the podcast. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's time for your favorite segment and mine, the comings and goings, fortunately. Most of the goings have already gone. So <laughs> <laughs> we're looking at welcoming incoming civil servants. And we begin with a well-deserved welcome to two folks we've covered a lot and who were finally confirmed by the Senate last week. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco and Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta, who was confirmed Ooh. 51 to 49 with Murkowski jumping over. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that is uh, one Republican vote, despite the fact that, as we covered in Episode 9 with Adam Klasfeld, literally all of the attacks on her were nonsense. Um, but the nice part is, since you listeners actually helped take back the Senate, none of that matters. You get the same authority with 51 votes as if you got 100, right? So, um, and, and, and look, if you are not on board with what a phenomenal pick 
Vanita Gupta is. Go back, listen to that episode nine. She is the person you want in that role if you're intending to get serious about voting rights cases. Um, it, it's just I, I couldn't be happy. Yeah. And we also talked to Adam Fernandez, too, right? Lawyers for Good Government about yep. his work with Vanita Gupta. Also incredible. Uh, but that, yeah, she's amazing. And, and Biden also announced six more nominations today. First up, near and dear to my heart, mm-hmm. is Donald Remy, nominee for Deputy Secretary of the VA. We call him DEPSEC VA. He was a U.S. Army captain. You remember how I was like, the deputy secretary better be a veteran, because when they put Dennis McDonough in there, I'm like, I don't know, him. seems like a nice fella, but we could use a veteran at the top. Yeah, at the VA, that seems, <laughs> you know, plausible. <gasps> yeah, he's currently the chief legal officer and COO for the NCAA, so he's helped run a large organization, a very large organization, yeah. <gasps> And he's got impeccable legal credentials. He was a partner at a big law firm running complex investigations. And uh, before that, he was deputy assistant attorney general. And before that, he was assistant to the general counsel for the Army. Oh, and he's co-chair of the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Yay! Yep. Uh, (laughs) I I wish he was deciding my case for wrongful termination with the VA. (laughs) Uh, And he's a graduate of a historically black law school, Howard, in D.C. So a smart guy, a vet, not a political hack. Thank you, sir. And I hope that you are glued to the hip of Dennis McDonough, a non-veteran who I have no idea who he is. But welcome aboard, Donald. Oh, that's fantastic. Next up, Miriam Delphin Rittman. She's the nominee for Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use for DHS. And uh, this might surprise you, AG. This this isn't a patronage pick. Oh. She's not the head of a bank that loaned money uh, under questionable circumstances or a person who bundled campaign contributions. She's the commissioner of the Connecticut State Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. I actually know somebody, a good friend of mine, uh, used to work in that uh, in that that State Department. Um, and, and Connecticut is kind of a model uh, for the nation, uh, particularly in homelessness. Um, but uh, uh, she's been in the behavioral health field for over 20 years. She's gotten like every kind of honor you can get from national organizations. Right. She's there to do her goddamn job. So welcome aboard, Dr. Delphin Rippin. So wait, she's not on the board of directors for a pharmaceutical company that developed Prozac no, or something? No, no. Just, just somebody that uh, that cares about addiction uh, and, and, and mental health issues. An actual mental yeah, health professional. Yeah, not too many people know this. My bachelor's degree was behavioral science oh. with a focus in addictive disorders. I didn't know that. Explains a lot, doesn't it? No, okay. Now, I also want to welcome Solomon Green, who's a senior fellow at the Urban Institute and a policy wonk, which I love, mm-hmm. in fair and affordable housing as Biden's nominee for Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research at the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, right? Yep. Uh, this is one for all the conspiracy freaks because Green was previously a senior program officer at the Open Society Foundations. So that means he's literally taken money from George Soros. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for the Q caucus to wrap their tiny little brains around this one. And that's a big hello to you, Solomon Green. <laughs> I just cashed my Soros check, uh, so I appreciate you. Mine's behind. I, I, I get a do some inquiries. <laughs> haven't gotten it. Uh, but I do need to congratulate uh, Rajesh Nayak, who is Biden's nominee for Assistant Secretary for Policy for the Department of Labor. Um, Nayak is currently at the DOL, right? So he's a senior advisor there. He's previously been the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy back under Obama, right? So eminently qualified, um, had to take a break for four years from the Department of Labor when it was staffed by idiots picked by a criminally insane game show host. Um, and and he spent that time as the deputy executive director at the National Employment Law Project, right? Um, he'd previously been a staff attorney there. He's worked at the Brennan Center for Justice, which I wholeheartedly endorse and give them money. So seriously, good, good on you, Mr. Nyack. Welcome back. Mm. Yes, welcome aboard. And a big welcome to Kimberly Jones, nominee for a member of the Board of Directors to the National Institute of Building Sciences. Uh, Another HBCU grad, Ms. Jones has a a bachelor's in civil engineering and an MS in civil and environmental engineering and a PhD in environmental engineering. 
She spent time at the EPA where her focus was on water and specifically wastewater. So this is another pick to make sure that the environmental risks are part of the calculations across the entire civil service. So that's wonderful. Welcome to you, Kimberly Jones. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, at this one is a little bit personal to me because uh, I want to give a big warm welcome to Baltimore native Helene Greenfeld. Um, she is the super genius lawyer and uh, chief counsel to Senator Maisie Hirono from Hawaii. Um, she was the one who was brought on to help Senate Democrats try and fight the Amy Coney Barrett nomination. Um, and she is now uh, President Biden's nominee for assistant attorney general for legislative affairs. Oh, perfect job for her. Yeah, she's totally overqualified for the position, right? Because she's worked as a lawyer in both the executive and the <laughs> legislative branches, right? So um, she's been a deputy assistant attorney general for civil rights. She was a deputy associate attorney general and counselor to then attorney general Eric Holder. Yeah, you, you, you get the drill, mm -hmm, right? So mm -hmm. Marilyn, represent... And uh, welcome aboard <laughs> awesome. to Helene Greenfeld. I'm so happy. Oh, that's a great pick. And uh, yeah, a little overqualified. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but finally, welcome aboard the impressively named G. Michael Seaman IV. <laughs> <laughs> As an assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Rhode Island, Mr. Seaman has been assigned to the CARES Act Fraud Unit in the United States Attorney's Office Criminal Division. He's the fourth assistant United States attorney assigned to work with federal and state and law enforcement in the investigation and the federal prosecution of CARES Act fraud cases. To date, the CARES Act Fraud Unit has charged two dozen individuals who have allegedly targeted more than $30 million in federal CARES Act funding. Oh, Wanting to stop fraud and abuse. That's such a weird feeling. Sorry. Weird. I know. Now that we're learning about all these inspector general investigations that got curbed or blocked or obstructed by Trump appointees into inspector general positions, <laughs> it's nice to have somebody who actually wants to generally inspect uh, things uh, and, you know, stop fraud and abuse. Yeah. Uh, this, he's Just so you know, he's not an inspector general, but... No, no, no. You know, yeah, he's he's an USA, but look, example. like, this guy, he's a, he's a 2014 law school grad, right? So he's been practicing Ooh. law for seven years, and that is... At, that I remember when I was a seventh year, right? Like, that's kind of the sweet spot for lawyers who are still young and hungry and, you know ready to work 20 hours a day and, you know, get a case and it's like, a, you know, a bulldog with a bone in their mouth. You know, you can't you can't pull it away. But but you also know what you're doing at that age. Right. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. great, great spot to be um, picking up the laboring or here on these these prosecutions. Right. Will not be the number one, uh, but will be busting his ass as a number two. And um, and, you know, you, you need that. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to him doing a lot of work behind the scenes. That's great. So they have an AUSA. Do they have a do they have a U.S. attorney for Rhode Island? Yeah, I don't think we have any U.S. attorneys appointed yet. For... Yeah, I think we I think it's I think it's just acting in, in Rhode yeah. Island. Almost all of them are, are acting U.S. attorneys right now. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll see them filter in over the next uh, coming months. I'm I'm sure. Yep. We're keeping our eyes open. All right. Well, those are comings and goings. Uh, very exciting. So, yeah, it seems like I mean, except for the borrowed people who we're going to continue to try to get rid of. It seems like most of the sh trash has been taken out. Uh, sure seems that way. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to monitor. It'll be more, more comings than goings, but, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So nice to announce on our first 100 days in Congress to, uh, in my speech to the joint session of opening arguments and Daily Beans <laughs> listeners, uh, that uh, so far for cleanup on aisle 45, it looks like we've got the bulk of the trash taken out. So that is wonderful news in the first hundred days. They're going to keep filtering out little by little, like I said, but mostly great people coming in to take this over. So what what a, what this is just such a good news segment for me. Uh, me too. So so AJ, what what are your goals for the next hundred days of cleanup on aisle 45? Mm, well, I'd like to start seeing uh, more uh, of the cooperating witnesses in the insurrection be made public. I, I personally think there's more than just the one. Uh, and the only reason we know about the one John Schaefer is, like I said, because <laughs> they accidentally filed it on the public docket instead of under seal. I think there are several more. And we heard that from uh, Marcy Wheeler. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'm also looking forward to uh, seeing some movement 
my prediction was that we would see indictments starting to drop in the Manhattan District Attorney uh, investigation into the Trump organization. We have not seen that. I only have a few day, cup two days left here in this month to make my <laughs> April prediction, but I'd like to see some charges start coming out of there. And I do think that um, as we learned, uh, Fonnie Willis, uh, Fulton County DA, uh, who's being obstructed a little bit uh, by the Raffensperger, uh, you know, Ben Roethlisberger's office. Um, I think uh, in she's going to start uh, dishing out subpoenas here in, in May. And so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, other than that. Gosh, just these U.S. attorneys. I'd like to start seeing some U.S. attorneys put in here. And my God, you know what would be so great is if somebody picked up those obstruction of justice charges against the former guy and ran with them in in the district. Oh, attorney, in the dare to dream. D.C. <laughs> the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office. Hey, statute of limitations isn't up until 2022. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. So. Yeah, you 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 stole mine in uh, Manhattan and Fulton County, but um, that's uh, it, it, that. That will be, uh, I think if we don't have real developments on that in the next quarter, um, then it's, you know, then it's time to kind of ask what's what's going on. So, yep. 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 They're still in the throes of it. So we'll see what happens. But this has been another a fabulous episode <laughs> of Clean Up on L45. Uh, I encourage you to become a patron. You get so many awesome perks. And then, of course, uh, thanks to everyone who came out yesterday to our live stereo show on the stereo app. You can follow us at Torres and at Allison Gill over there. And uh, be, once you follow us, you'll be notified when we go live. And tonight on Wednesday, you'll be there with Thomas doing your opening arguments. Um, this Thursday, Dana and I are off because she's she's writing a pilot. Ooh. And so she's I love it. So she's like, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. I'm like, cool, cool. Get it. Get it done. That's fantastic. Uh, but uh, those are fun. Those are super great on the stereo app. So anyway, that's it. That's all I've got for this week. I know it's a very short episode today. We didn't have much to cover. <laughs> yeah. We're coming in a nice trim 90 minutes or so. But, uh, <laughs> you know, this is this is how much we love talking to each other and we love doing the show. So Yeah. And there's just a lot to cover. Yeah. So I guess we'll see everybody next week. And uh, tune in tonight to uh, Biden's address to Congress. That's tonight, April 28th, 6 p.m. Pacific. 9 p.m. Eastern, and Zev Shalev and I will be covering it live. You can find that on my Twitter feed, Woo. at Muller She Wrote, at Daily Beans Pod. It's going to be a good time. Uh, we'll see you all next week. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written and produced by Allison Gill and Andrew Torres and is engineered and edited by Mackenzie Mazell and Starburns Audio. Fact-checking and research by Allison Gill and Andrew Torres with quality assurance and media by Muller She Wrote, LLC. Branding design and logo by Starburns Audio and Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. And our copy is written by Jesse Egan. Our music is written and recorded by Adam Orr and Christopher Hoffey and our opening sequence was designed by Allison Gill and mixed by Mackenzie Mazell and Starburns Audio. Follow us on Twitter at Aisle 45 Pod and listen wherever you get your podcasts. They might be giants have been on the road for too long. Too long. And they might be giants aren't even sorry. Not even sorry. And audiences like the shows too much. Too much. And now they might be giants are playing their breakthrough album Flood. All of it. And they still have time for other songs. They're fooling around. Who can stop They Might Be Giants and their liberal rock agenda? Who? No one. Decide to pay for it with somebody else's money.